Let us pray together. Lord, thank you that we can gather this afternoon in the name of your Son. We do pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to his presence. Assist us, O oh Lord, in such a way is that you might work in us today what you desire. We yield to your authority. We thank you that we, this congregation, and its clergy are yours. Work in and through them for the sake of the gospel in this community, that which is pleasing in your sight. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> I don't know why it is. I, I hate to begin a sermon by uh, confessing my own lack of observation, but I'm about to. I don't know how many times I've been here in the three years of my episcopacy, but certainly more than once. But only today. As I'm sitting in the back of the other building in one of the study rooms getting ready for this service, having left one this morning, did I see the mission statement for Shepherd of the Hills? Plain as day, I bet it's on every bulletin I've ever seen that I've been here. Did I notice it? No, my apologies. But it says, it is the mission of Shepherd of the Hills Episcopal Church to be a beacon of faith known for engaging all persons in the love and truth of Jesus Christ. Wow. That's a tall order. That's a lot more than saying we're just going to be like the church down the street. It's actually a very, very specific mission. And I'm glad, as your bishop, you should know that I resonate deeply with that kind of understanding of church. But it is more important than ever in the light of that statement and this occasion in this celebration of new ministry to understand that what we are doing here is in fact a celebration of a new ministry that really does involve all of you. This is not an installation service. You see, an installation service would say that everything's kind of humming along the way it should, and therefore what we're going to install, almost like, <coughs> like a light bulb, is somebody new to step in and fulfill a different function so that the organization continues to function. We don't call it an installation for a purpose. We call it a celebration of a new ministry. And if you will notice, all through those opening lines of the liturgy, it is never once described as his ministry. Instead, it's used to describe this ministry, which is the ministry that all of you share together. And so, yes, on the one hand, what's happening is this is a marker in time for a new rector. But more importantly than that, it is, in fact, a new step that literally an entire congregation takes together with their new rector to engage more deeply, more specifically focused in the ministry to which God has called you as a whole congregation. So, if there have any of you who have been doing a little work in the interim, who now that the rector is here, you go, oh, thank God, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> I would urge you to be cautious about that finale. <clears throat> Not because there shouldn't be t responsibilities that he takes on. We'll see that in the distribution of gifts for good gracious. Just about anything you can think of gets handed to him in some kind of symbol. It's a big job. But more than all of that, it is in fact, now that this is beginning, an invitation for you as a congregation to think in a new way, creatively, prayerfully, innovatively, about what does it mean to be a congregation who understands her job description is to be a beacon of faith. What that says is, if I were to go down here to the Circle K shell station, which I stopped where I stopped before we came in, that's all I was <laughs> And I say, you know, I'm about to go to Shepherd of the Hills. I don't know a lot about this congregation. What do you know about it? Well, 
what would the man or woman behind the counter say? What is your reputation? Because your language, your language says is that you're to be a beacon of faith known. In other words, you have a reputation in the community as a congregation that has a very specific job description for engaging all persons in the love and truth of Jesus Christ. That also is a fairly big job because it's an extraordinarily inclusive statement, all persons. Congregations have a tendency to see to be like clubs. And what I mean by that is that the people who show up generally look pretty much like each other. There'll be some diversity, of course, but it all almost has to do with geographic location, um, the liturgy that we do and the music that we do also, in essence, assumes a certain kind of literary person, more often than not, with the college education vocabulary that can understand our language and therefore, you know, fits in. But if you've made the commitment, the audacious, I might add, commitment to engage all persons, that's a very, very different understanding. But I think a more biblical one of what church is meant to be. In other words, it means, for example, this, as you look at your surrounding community and you look at your congregation, you ask the question, who's not in the room? Who lives in our community? And how might we reach out to them? Because you see, if your purpose is to engage all persons. That's a very, to use a church word, that's a very missionary responsibility. Because your commitment, you see, most people think of congregations as, what's my job, particularly as a rector, is my job is to take care of the people who show up at my door. Love them, care for them, visit them in the hospital, be them in times of crisis, as well as in times of joy, prayer, share the scriptures together, learn how to love one another and how to follow Christ together. In other words, the focus has everything to do with who's here already. Your job description says something quite different. If we're to engage all persons, that means we're thinking about the community and perhaps beyond. It is not dissimilar hopefully intentionally so, of Jesus' commandment in the book of Acts, where he says, you go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That was Jesus' commission to his disciples before his ascension. In many ways, that's what's reflected in your mission statement. And to engage them in such a way as what that happens is to engage all persons in the love. In other words, we're not just sort of being nice to people here. We're actually finding ways to sacrificially care because that is the very nature of the love of Jesus. The height of our understanding of the love of Jesus is his death on the cross, you see. Greater love hath no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. I have called you friends. That, you see, is the love of Jesus Christ. And as that is expressed, the truth comes with it, because that kind of love is supernatural. And so there's no mistaking where that love comes from. It's not just that somehow this particular group of people is particularly likable or generous, or kind, or others-focused. But rather, there is a caliber of sacrificial giving and caring, caring being expressed in the community, as well as to one another, that people out there find quite remarkable. They are known for it. Does that make sense? OK, so how do you do that? What I want to do is call your attention to just a couple of things that's in the gospel reading for tonight. First of all, where do you get the resources to live like that? The very first line. 
As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. If that line wasn't in there, the rest of it would have felt like a burden too large to bear. The call to lay down one's life, to be considered a friend of God. Who am I to be considered a friend of God? To be chosen to bear fruit? I, I can't do that. I can barely tie my shoes in the morning. No, as the Father has loved me, so I have. In other words, this is not something I'm cranking up right now. It is the flow of my life toward you. So I have loved you. In other words, how we be, even begin to enter into this kind of challenging vocation is to ask God to show us and to work within us in new ways what it means to be loved by Him. To know that in Him I can be all of who I am and that I am forgiven. To know that He will provide for all of my resources and needs, which He says right here, according to His riches and glory, so that I can in fact step out in faith and do things that are absolutely outside of the question of logic. And yet, I feel called to do. You see, to know that I am loved by a God who is as generous and powerful and kind and gracious as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ means I can step out and care for other people because I know that God has already put those resources within me. Do I feel them? No. It's a faith act. Remember, you're supposed to be what? A beacon of faith. That means I may not feel very much from time to time. You know, feelings come and go. Sometimes I feel the joy of Christ. Sometimes I feel His peace. Sometimes I'm just a mess. Right? You too, huh? <laughs> and because you see that's the case, but to live as a beacon of faith says, whether I'm feeling great or whether I'm feeling lousy, I'm still stepping out because there's a need out there and I know that I'm being called to meet. That's to walk in faith, you see. It's not waiting to somehow feel ready. If you do that, you will never do it. Because there are always places inside of me where I still wrestle with guilt and condemnation. There are always still places in me where I wrestle with a kind of fear of rejection. And, and what if I do it wrong? I and mean, what if they don't like what I have to say that pulls me back, that keeps me from operating in that kind of unbelievably supernatural generosity? No, to walk as a beacon of faith says, regardless of how I'm feeling when I get up this morning, I know that God has things for me to do today. And so God, give me the grace to see the doors that you're opening and to step in where they're there. And I'm working with a group of people who have made that same kind of commitment so that when we get together, we trade stories. So tell me, how's it going? How is God using you today? What's been happening in your world? Church members almost never have those kinds of conversations. <laughs> We're so very superficial with each other. Love the dress. You look terrific today. Oh, I just got that on the trip from Orlando. I had a wonderful time. And it's not that that's not a bad conversation. We should take interest in the things that interest each other. But if that's all it is, then we're just the Kiwanis Club. No, no, no. There's something actually deeper and more important than that. We're saying, again, speaking of faith, we're getting up in the morning saying, God, how do you want to use me? And when you begin to meet together, whether it's in a Bible study or in a guild group or your choir or other group, that becomes a part of the conversation. Is there something that our group together could do in a way that demonstrates the love of Christ in our community? Or within our own fellowship, is there somebody who's been feeling particularly left out? Is there a step that we can take to bring that person more closely into the life of our congregation? You see, if I didn't know that I had the resources of Christ within me, I don't know that I would want to ask those kinds of questions. I'd much rather hang out with people who are just like me. It's the love of Christ that intentionally invites me to be with people with whom I actually have very little in common. Because that's what the love of Christ looks like. You see, to be honest, Jesus doesn't have a lot in common with us, as you and I talk common. 
Our cultures are different. Our priorities are different. The way we spend our time is different. Jesus ever lives to make intercession before the Father for us. How many of us spend that kind of time in prayer? Mostly, probably very few. You see, that's why Jesus loves us with the kind of love and imparts into us the kind of love that we need to be able to love other people. Because you see, that's exactly how he deals with us. His generosity that bridges the culture gap. His forgiveness that goes beyond hurt. His ability to step in and wash feet when there's just not much there. All of that, you see, looks like Jesus. And that is how each of us are being loved by him and have been loved by him. So that has to be where we start. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Jesus saying that to his disciples. That alone, in fact, in that one phrase, is all that we need to be able to be faithful. Everything else in the rest of the gospel lesson flows from it, about loving each other, living underneath his commandments, all of the other pieces, the abiding to which we are called, all make sense in the light of the fact that we have been loved. In the same way that God loves his own son. The temptation is to settle for something less. Financial cohesion. Personal safety, popularity, all of those are extraordinary temptations. And I want to say to you, every single one of those is a goddess and not the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of safety, I had to quote this because he's from your institution, George. This is Miroslav Volk of Yale. He says, if security is our goddess, we will serve her with violence, trampling upon the rights of others, and no one will be safe. Now, he's speaking socially and politically, but the same can be true for a church. If the premier value of a local congregation is the safety of its members, inevitably what happens is that more and more walls go up, less and less contact with the outside world, and if infringements of safety happen within the congregation, that person gets stepped out. That, I've seen it. So of you. And we live in a world that is getting more dangerous by the moment. It takes the people filled with the love of Christ to say, really, almost anti-culturally, you know, safety here is not our highest value. I mean, for some people to hear that automatically invites fear right in the center of their stomachs. What do you mean? Is it going to be dangerous? Yeah, at times. It will be. It will require tremendous risk. But God is very gentle with us. He will take us into that risk one step at a time. If Shepherd of the Hills, again, is your description, you'll learn first what it is to hang out with the sheep. Sheep are very safe and docile people, creatures. And after a while, you can get your footing and get the lay of the land. But then, you see the eyes of the wolf. And what will you do then? For to follow this shepherd means taking that staff and going after the wolf. Not just standing there hoping that he decides to go someplace else. That's what it means to care for the sheep, you see. So is it risky? <laughs> It's risky. But that's a part of what it means to be a beacon of faith. Willing to step out. So that even if you step out almost alone, you know you are actually surrounded with the very loving care of Jesus Christ. Which is why, again, the foundation of living as a beacon is knowing that as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, so I have loved you. So, in conclusion, this is a new adventure. 
It's a new ministry that you will share together with your new rector. Learning in a whole new way, creative, innovative, exciting, interesting ways to say, how can we be that group of people that are known in the community as people of faith, a beacon of faith? Express, engaging all persons in the love and truth of Jesus Christ. It's a huge order, but it's worth every second of the effort. And I will look forward to see how God uses you to touch this community. As you love one another, and as you love the people that God sends your way. Amen. Amen.